Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It's a story that's got everything. Presidents, prime ministers, billionaires, politicians, professors, IT whiz kids, and most important of all, you, me, and the ballot box. A former employee of Cambridge Analytica, a data research company, has gone rogue, or maybe was a rogue, who's now gone straight, depending on how you view him. He'll tell me in a minute. He's here. Chris Wiley, the pink-haired whistleblower who says Trump and Brexit happened because of a misuse of data by Cambridge Analytica and others, and because of good old-fashioned Cheating. Are you buying his story? It's a complicated one, so uh, another question both to myself and to you is do we really understand it? Do you have a question for Chris? We're also joined by Kyle Taylor of Fair Vote UK. They'll both take your calls after 1.30, but get the, do get them in now, 0345 6060 973. If you're confused or overwhelmed by the Cambridge Analytica stole the referendum stories, then you are not alone. There's a lot of detail and almost every claim is challenged at the highest levels. Uh, the central figure in all of it is the former Cambridge Analytica employee turned whistleblower Chris Wiley, who's here with me in the studio. Uh, as I said, he's that pink-haired man whose face has been on newspapers and TV screens all week. I hope you don't mind me describing you in that way. I think it's a shortcut to people knowing who I'm talking about when we're on the radio. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I'm pink hair. You have I, I don't. I don't hide the fact. You don't. Uh, you can't hide the fact. Also with us in the studio is Kyle Taylor of the Fair Vote Project, Fair Vote UK on Twitter. If you want to have a look, and Kyle, you'll tell us more in a few minutes about what Fair Vote UK is all about. Yeah, happy to. Chris, first of all, uh, welcome. Thanks to both of you for coming in. Um, it is a complex story. You've got uh, a, a slice of some of the evidence with you in the studio now, um, or what you say is evidence that proves your story. I know it's a difficult one, but a thumbnail sketch of what this is all about for people who might be joining the story for the first time? Uh, sure. Would you like me to talk? I could talk about... There's there's actually a couple stories, so I think that's why people find it complicated and confusing. Um, so if, if you want, I can start with the United States and Facebook data, or I could talk about Brexit. Brexit, I think, first. Brexit, okay. So um, the crux the crux of, uh, of the story, as it were, uh, uh, centers around a company called Aggregate IQ. So Aggregate IQ was set up during my time at Cambridge Analytica to service Cambridge Analytica projects. Um, and and I think it's important for people to understand that this this small company on an island on the west coast of Canada received 40 percent of vote leave spending. So it it was actually a very major player in in the referendum. So this is not this is not you know uh, it, although you know this is a company that no one's heard of. It actually played a huge role in the referendum. Um, something else that I think is is helpful for people to understand is just a little bit about um, the law in Britain and what and what the law is um, because you know I understand that most people don't spend their time reading electoral law books so in Britain um, there are spending limits for campaigns uh, so during the referendum the campaigns had a certain budget limit and they weren't allowed to spend more than that the reason why we have spending caps uh, in Britain and many other countries do is so that campaigns uh, focus on listening to people rather than money and you win because of votes, not because you has more money than the other. And, and you say so, that you say that vote leaves forty percent of their funding came from Aggregate IQ. They no, say forty percent of their spending, oh, their spending went, went to Aggregate IQ. Oh, sorry, IQ. apologies, but but they say absolutely not. These were separate separate situations. Well, that's. That's a declared expense, so you can just look at the Electoral Commission's website and just add it up. It, it was 40%. So just getting back to what the law is, um, these, the, these spending limits are in place so that you can't go out and just buy an election because you have more money. Something else important to understand is when different campaigns are set up, they are not allowed to coordinate unless they declare that coordination. And the reason for that is because if we have spending limits and you can set, if we, if we allowed coordination, 
uh, you could just, once you hit your spending limit, you could just set up campaign B and then campaign C and campaign D and, and so on and just keep spending. So the, the law would be neutered if, if we allowed that. So coordination, although this sounds really abstract, is actually a really important part of the law to make sure that, you know, our democratic institutions... There has important. to be a Chinese wall, essentially, around Absolutely. every and election it's campaign. To, it's to ensure that you can't just buy a vote. And so that's really important for people to understand. So what happened on, on during the referendum is a, a campaign was set up called Believe. That campaign was based out of Vote Leave headquarters. It was set up uh, by Vote Leave's lawyers, and we have documentation for that. The Constitution... Is it there? It's in here. I can show you. Um, the, the, the Constitution of Believe was written by Vote Leave's lawyers, so that's documented. Um, they were based in the headquarters of Vote Leave. Uh, all of the money didn't even go to the account, right? So Vote Leave nominally gave Believe money, but that money actually didn't even hit their account. It went straight to AIQ. There are, there were all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of evidence to show that they were coordinating, that there was reporting structures, that they reported to Vote Leave um, through emails, uh, through text messages, chats, screenshots, etc. They had something called a shared drive where they would put their advertising and their content, their strategy documents, the results. So that, you said to all drive, intents and purposes they were the same group. Yeah. So what? The, the, and 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 just a point on the shared drive. The shared drive was set up by Vote Leave, although it says Believe, it's owned and administered by, 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 by Vote Leave staff. And after being notified by the Electoral Commission and the ICO that they were under investigation, uh, Victoria Woodcock, who is the Chief Operations Officer for Vote Leave, went onto that shared drive and attempted to remove herself, Dominic Cummings, who is the campaign manager for Vote Leave, and Henry DeZoot, who is the head of digital. So when you when you look at their behavior, not only were, were they, were there clear reporting structures, and not only were there, uh, you know, the, the fact that this, this entity Believe was actually set up Yep, by okay. vote leave. Th they, but when they were notified of being under, that they were under investigation, they then go and try to remove themselves from a key piece of evidence. They they deny what you're saying, and they well, also I, I can show you here. All right, but yeah, but they they also say that communication isn't the same as coordination, and the electoral commission when it when. Uh, it was investigated, found in their favour, or did not find well, because, what you say was there. Well, they've reopened the investigation. So to be clear, and you're, you're, you're re providing they re them with they all re of this. They reopened the investigation before they even saw this. And you're providing them with all of that the, now. All of this is with the Electoral Commission. Okay. Yeah. And the Information Commissioner is also. And the Information all of Commissioner's this. office. Can I ask you as well? Link that f for me as briefly as you can to Cambridge Analytica. Right. So th all of this money went to a company in Canada called Aggregate IQ. So Aggregate IQ was set up. Uh, by Cambridge Analytica to service Cambridge Analytica projects. The story uh, that we heard about last week, which is about the misappropriated Facebook data um, of 50 million people. The people's information, yeah. Yeah, private data. Um, the, the software that that data got put into called the Ripon platform was built by uh, uh, Aggregate IQ for Cambridge Analytica. So, so the, these companies, although technically separate with different names, you know, a AIQ has an intellectual property license agreement. All of their contracting was with Cambridge Analytica. So it, it, you can think of it like a franchise, as it were, of Cambridge Analytica. You obviously believe that the, the, the coordination of all of those bodies that you've just mentioned mm -hmm. um, brought the Brexit vote to, to pass, something you say yourself you would have supported. Um, I'm a Eurosceptic. I, right. I, I'm, 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 you didn't have a vote, just to be clear, yeah. Uh, well, I, wasn't, I wasn't in the country at yeah. the time, but I'm a Commonwealth citizen, so well, I, I could have voted where I hear. Let, let me just read to you what um, the journalist Brendan O'Neill says about this idea of a, a great conspiracy against the, the British voting public here. He, mm -hmm. he says the narrative around it of an enormous act of, of misinformation, um, uh, which is what you and others are suggesting happened, um, it is actually what you are now doing, an enormous act of misinformation. To use his words, he says, the truth of the referendum period is that Britain's political class, 
capitalist class, educational elite, uh, the overseers of public and intellect intellectual life, uh, leading political figures, uh, many of them, most of them, called for Remain. The establishment, and I was in the country at the time, and mm. this is true. I'm not mm. saying it's necessarily true that you're misinforming people now, but this was the truth of that campaign. Mm. The establishment, through its weight, its power, its money, and its arguments behind Remain. If there was, says Brendan O'Neill, informational dominance, which is what you're now claiming happened via Cambridge Analytica and others, if there was, in early 2016, it was by Remain. So... Just to unpack that a little bit, I don't, I don't disagree. So just to be clear, like I'm, I supported Leave. I'm a Eurosceptic, so I don't, I don't, I don't deny that you know the people in London and and you know big businesses supported Remain. That's well, absolutely true. Well, it was David true. Cameron, George Osborne, yeah. seventy-five percent of MPs, but just most unpa- businesses. Just, but just to unpack that a little bit, you know what you're saying is that you know because Remain was winning that vote leave needed to cheat in order to win and i don't think that's a fair that's i, I don't think that's a defensible argument um, you know just because just because you know r- r- just because remain had more money or just because remain had more support doesn't justify cheating to catch up oh i'm not suggesting it does at all of course not um nothing justifies cheating i don't think but what they are saying is that the, the, the British public aren't that stupid. There was, a, there was, not, a, there I'm was. Not, a I'm very... not saying that the British public. But you, are, are but you stupid. do believe they were duped or mis, misused during the during the vote. There, there's the campaign. A, there, there's so what I'm saying is that money influences elections, right? And that's why we put limits on it so that there's a level playing field and that it's fair. And if you overspend against the law, that is cheating. And if you cheat. In, if you cheat in, in the Olympics, you know, if you're caught doping, you lose your medal, right? If you're caught cheating on an exam, you get a fail. And, 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 and the debate, the, the debate in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the case of doping isn't, you know, how much drug did that person take or would they have come in first or second anyway? It, you know, if you get, if you caught cheating on exam, it's not would you have gotten a first or not? It's the fact that in order to maintain the integrity of that process and in order to maintain the meaning of winning and the validity of winning and the substance of winning, you can't have cheating. Okay. After the break, we'll look more on the data and the use or misuse of data. And I'll ask you just how different it is, you believe it is, from previous use of data in in other elections. Chris Wiley, thanks very much indeed. Stay with us. Um, And Kyle Taylor, I promise you, we'll hear from you as well in the next few minutes. 0345. 6060973 for your questions uh, to Chris in particular I think and to Kyle as well if you wish obviously um, do you believe that Cambridge Analytica and some of the other organisations that Chris has just mentioned there genuinely swayed your vote or anybody else's 03456060973 the number to call you can text 84850 or tweet at LBC and how much do you understand about the, uh, the way your data is used I'm sure Chris will be able to explain more uh, about that do call with your questions 0345 6060 973. It's 18 minutes past one now. I'm joined in the studio by Chris Wiley, a former employee of Cambridge Analytica, the data research company, um, who now is essentially telling us here that the uh, referendum vote was stolen in a sense by cheating. Um, the people that he accuses of that deny it vehemently. Also with us in the studio is Kyle Taylor of the Fair Vote Project. More on that in just a second. Chris, th- th- there are those who call you a brave whistleblower and there are those who say that you are the problem. Okay. Well, and, and, and well respond to that. Sh- sure. Um, I, I don't know how, uh, you know, uh, me coming forward and working with the authorities to investigate um, illegality, uh, going and testifying at Parliament and notifying people through the media, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that is being part of the problem, I think that's actually part of the solution to the problem. But you, you've said you um, regret your initial part in uh, Cambridge Analytica's Absolutely. connections to Facebook. That's Absolutely. the thing I was alluding to specifically. Ah, I, sure, I should have been clearer. Sure. Um, at, at what kind of response have you had from people? Because you're either hero or villain, aren't you? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't make myself out to be um, perfect. You know, or and I'm not here to sit on some kind of moral high horse. Um, part of the reason why, look, I could have just stayed stayed low and simply worked with the authorities on investigating it and kept it quiet. Um, but I made the decision to own up to uh, you know some pretty severe mistakes that I made, 
uh, in setting up Cambridge Analytica because I thought that you know, not only was this an issue that should be in investigated by law enforcement and regulatory authorities um, on both sides of the, uh, of the Atlantic, but also that because this has to do with very, very personal information of people, th that people themselves should know about what happened. And, and, that's, and that's, that's why I've gone out of my way to work with, you know, The Guardian and The New York Times and Channel, Channel 4, 4 as well, yeah. and also testify at Parliament. Thank you for mentioning them. I should have already, so th th thank you for doing that, Chris. On the question of misuse of data, again, mm -hmm. very confusing because uh, Facebook say some aspects of their the data they had on people, the information they had on people was free to be used by research companies, but the Cambridge Analytica then took information from those research companies it, or, and those apps it should never have had. Mm -hmm. Is that what you say happened as well? Yeah, the, the, the data was... Um, Stolen? Uh, um, let me misappropriated? Be let me be careful with my words. Um, it was misappropriated. Um, by uh, Cambridge Analytica, um, you know, both in terms of against the terms and conditions of Facebook, but also more broadly, you know, the law in this country is that in order to use and process people's data, you need uh, some form of informed consent. Um, and so th the fact that uh, the applications were pulling not only the data of the, the user of the application, but all of their friends means that um, you know, a person, so long, if you were a friend of somebody who had that app, you would have no idea that your data was being pulled, modeled, and, and that your, your psychological disposition was being, you know, profiled by this company. Um, and, and, and so, you know, par part of the problem with that is that people didn't know that it was happening. They weren't asked if, if that, you know, for their permission to, to do that. Um, and that and that's a real problem. How different is it to uh, the kind of use of data that the Obama campaign, uh, for example, uh, it w trumpeted loud and proud, and were and were uh, you know people were impressed by the way they used sure. people's online data. How? Why is this different? So. Something to just make clear is that um, I don't have an innate problem with people using data or companies using data. I'm not an anti-data crusader. I think data data is the electricity of our of our modern economy. Um, and but know, we should and, own it and, and say what happens to it. But just like how electricity can be very dangerous if proper safety standards, you know, and rules aren't followed, you can electrocute yourself and die. But at the same time, it can power the lights in the studio, and you know, th this entire program is powered by electricity, right? So. So data is like that, um, and and so the 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 the, the difference between um, what Cambridge Analytica does and the Obama campaign is really fundamental. It's the fact that the Obama campaign didn't base its you know base its messaging on on deception, uh, rumor campaigns, and and fake news. It didn't it didn't it didn't set out to but, deceive but did, people. But did it misuse data? Did, did people really know the data it had on them any more than they knew the data Trump's campaign had on them? Well, that would be a question for the Obama campaign. Um, and and what I would say is that, you know, we shouldn't create sort of these, these sort of uh, f false equivalencies or, you know, well, what about this campaign or what no, about that campaign? No, sure, but do we know for two, sure it's a false equivalence? I'm not sure we do. Two, two wrongs don't make a right. So if the Obama campaign did misuse data, I'm not going to defend that. But it, what I'm talking about here is what Cambridge Analytica has done. Um, and, and I think actually what Cambridge Analytica has done is fundamentally different uh, than what the Obama campaign did because, you know, this is a firm that does not respect the veracity of the information that is disseminating. And when did you wake up to your part in this and think, right, I have to do something? Um, so I get this question a lot, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer that there's these sort of sudden moments of realizing the aha moment, the light bulb in your head. It, it doesn't, at least for me, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, a sudden realization that the company that I had set up, um, you know, was imparting a great amount of harm on the American electorate and and, and others. It was a gradual realization. I think if we, if I want to point to a moment where it it really hit home the election of Donald Trump um, after a campaign of total vitriol. Um, you know, the fact that uh, this campaign uh, was supported by the data that that I helped this company acquire and set up um, was really problematic for me. 
And, um, you know, very shortly after that, I, uh, you know, started working with The Guardian. Um, so although people are seeing, you know, me in the news now, you know, one of the things to remember is I actually started working uh, on this on this project uh, with The Guardian and The New York Times and, and, and Channel 4, you know, almost a year ago. Um, and it was a long process because it was a very complicated thing to investigate. Um, I went to the uh, law enforcement authorities and worked with them for several months before coming forward uh, in the media. Um, so it's been more of a journey than a single moment that... If, if Cambridge Analytica uh, is, is proved to have broken the law, uh, mm. have you... Um, that would that that would be uh, a question for a lawyer, not for me. But what I will think say, you have? but what I will say is that the Information Commissioner's Office uh, has put in, in writing that I'm not uh, currently under investigation, uh, yeah. and that's in part because I have I have proactively disclosed, uh, you know, the wrongdoing of the company. Kyle, I'm conscious we haven't heard from you yet. You have um, a, a set up a rally for this evening. Is, is it this evening? Yes. Yeah, yeah so we're going to rally this evening in Parliament Square. And, and you, you've rightly made the distinction between, or the, the two of you, Chris, as, as well, have made the distinction between the money, which we spoke about at the beginning, and, and the use slash misuse of data. It's the money, it's the electoral spending you're focused on, isn't it? Yeah, so we set up the Fair Vote Project because in this world of everything being mediated, my big concern was that uh, if this information was reported in a certain publication and not another, then people would disregard it. So we took the decision to publish the actual evidence. So we explain how electoral law works, we explain the suggestion of cheating, and we explain to people, and they can see the documents for themselves. Our whole thing is see the evidence and decide for yourselves. But we want to be proactive about solutions. Okay, so we've heard a lot about you know, what the Remain campaign cheated by more, the government letter. We've got a function on our site for people to share if they have any evidence of wrongdoing from any campaign. Because this isn't just about Brexit. This is much bigger than Brexit. If we let cheating go this time, you know, I've heard so much dismissal of, you know, sort of, oh, well, it wasn't that much, or they were the underdog, or the other side cheated too. All that does for me is, is make the case stronger that we need to do something. So we're pushing for a fair vote uh, around the Brexit issue. And more importantly, we're pushing for real electoral reform. You're pushing for reform. a second vote, are you? Yeah. Well, I mean, you are against the first Brexit. Uh, well, I mean, that's an interesting point. So I, the, the whistleblower... I'm, I'm not. Chris I know, is I know a, but he is. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the Believe whistleblower, Shamir Sani, is also a lever. He was a lever then and he was a lever now. And I think it's a really important... So that's not what you're seeking, a rerun of this vote, or is it? We're seeking a fair vote. If, this, if it's, if it's sh shown that the first one had massive cheating, and cheating is cheating. I don't it doesn't matter how much it was or who, how many people did it. Cheating is wrong. And it, this is a decision of a generation, and we, sh we cannot have a future based on a lie or a cheat. And I think we need that certainty as a country, because the last two years have been nothing but division. And I think that we can come together and say... You know, we believe in, in defending our democracy, and some things are actually just deep, deep values in our society. Are either of you British citizens? I'm conscious that listeners at home will hear you both and think, hang on a sec. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'm who a, are you? I'm a, um, I'm a Canadian citizen and a U.S. citizen. I'm a permanent resident. My grandparents met in the Blackpool Tower Ballroom in 1947, and I have most of my family live in the U.K. I have deep, deep ties here. But I think that's an interesting point as well, because for me, this isn't just a right. This is a privilege, because I'm an immigrant here. And when it's a privilege, it, it, it even hits you, for me, it hits me even harder, I think, because I've seen in my, where I grew up in the U.S., what happens when unfettered spending uh, hits, in, it hits democracy. And I don't want that to happen here. I love this country. This is my home. It's where I want to spend my life. But just very quickly on, on, the, on the big picture reforms, what we want to do as well is, is push for electoral reform. We think the Electoral Commission needs prosecutorial power. We think that campaigns should be reporting as they spend. The idea that you wait four weeks after the election and then submit your books, why are campaigns not uh, not doing that? And very lastly, no coordinated groups. No, here's 700,000 pounds, here's 700,000 pounds. And on the Cambridge Analytica point, we need a digital bill of rights for democracy. How are we going to deal with data in the future in our democracy? Because oil barons have been replaced by data barons. Which was raised in... Parliament just yesterday. Um, more from you both uh, in the next half an hour. 0345 6060 973 for your points, your questions to either Chris or to Kyle. One word just before we go to the break, uh, Chris. What should people listening be more worried about? The spending on elections or their information being spread about? Both. Okay, more in a minute. Hello, good afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me, I have in the studio with me. Two men who think that <clears throat> our democracy, let alone my throat, 
is under threat from plain old cheating and misuse of funds. Chris Wiley. Cambridge Analytica whistleblower and Kyle Taylor, the founder of the Fair Vote Project. Do get your calls into them 0345 973 Do you, based on what you understand and what you have read and heard today here on LBC about the uh, Brexit vote, about the Trump success in America, do you believe it's because of data misuse, of financial uh, abuses in this country? Are you buying it, basically, is my question to you. 0345 973 the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Uh, Chris Wiley, have you um, been concerned for your safety at all in the last week? Are people responding to you in, in very either, you know, as I said earlier, hero or villain? Um, I've had, well, I'll start by saying I've had a lot of support, which I appreciate, um, but, you know, uh, I, I no longer can walk down the street, um, particularly after the Brexit story has come out, which is obviously much more controversial here. Um, uh, so, it, it, yes, there, there have been um, people who have quite forcefully expressed their views. Uh, are you afraid at all? Um, I wouldn't say that I, I'm afraid, but I have to be a lot more um, aware of where I am. And um, there's certain things that I've been told that I shouldn't do. I shouldn't, for example, go grocery shopping on my own anymore. I can't do that and, and things like that. Um, and how's this been for your family? They must be concerned. Um, yeah, it it has been quite stressful, particularly for my parents, because uh, you know my my uh, my mum and dad are both doctors, and they've had uh, people f f you know find out where they work and go into the clinic and um, you know either ask lots of questions or, or, or yell at them and scare their patients, um, which you know I think is unfortunate because if you have a, an issue with something that I'm saying, say it to me, don't say it to somebody who's who's not involved in that, particularly if they have patients and vulnerable people in their waiting room. Now, Steve Bannon, um, whose name is familiar to most people these days, a former Trump advisor, um, but former vice president of Cambridge Analytica, a man you'd have worked directly with, I imagine, I mm -hmm. presume. Yeah. Um, here's what he had to say. Uh, uh, he doesn't mention you personally, but here's what he's had to say about your uh, concerns on data. Have a listen. The data from Facebook is just about the cost of it. That data is out there. It's a marketplace for your data. It's bought and sold every day. Yeah, but the people it's didn't know it was being leaked. The, that's, the, the, that's, 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 a different, that's an issue between Cambridge, the professor, and Facebook. And by the way, is it open of that? Were, were you aware no, of that? Did, 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 I did, didn't, even know about, yeah, didn't even know about the Facebook was, mining. But hang on, but hang on, hang on. Yeah. The point is, that is Facebook's business. In 2008, it was Google and Facebook that went to Barack Obama and met him in San Francisco airport and told him all about the power of this personal data. So the great opposition party, media, never went after the Obama campaign, never went after the progressive left, as had been doing this for years. And in 2013, when I thought that a, a data company might be important, all of a sudden it becomes global news. And that's how Facebook, that's how they take your stuff for free. They, they sell it and monetize it for huge margins. That's why the companies trade for such high valuations. He's cuffing it away as though it were nothing. Right. So the, the the again, we have to get back to the the point that it's not just about data. It's about how data is used. Right. So to use an analogy, um, you know, a knife can be a, a murder weapon, or you can make uh, you know an amazing dinner with it. Right. Um, so it, it can be a tool, or it can be a weapon. And data is the same thing. So just because other companies or other campaigns use data, that's not the point. He's missing the entire point. Using, using data without people's consent, without people's permission, first of all, and then secondly, using that data that you acquired without consent to then manipulate, to then deceive, to then coerce people, uh, is 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 fundamentally I've already, I've already got, is fundamentally unethical. Uh, well, I've already got calls and texts from people coming in saying it's old news. Ad ad companies have been doing it for years. We know they do it. We're not stupid. Ad ad companies don't set out to create a web of disinformation and deception, and that's what Cambridge Analytica does, in its own words. So just because an ad company 
uses uses data to you know sell you a, a new microwave that's fundamentally different but than it, making you believe well, making someone believe in a conspiracy theory that's I'm, not true well i'm still that's not fundamentally different well, it, that's a it, different application of that data is it fundamentally different from the beauty industry telling me every day that I can have perfect skin if I use this cream, knowing that most women are concerned about their looks and do fret about their grooming and what have you, that, that, that actually sure, that, that they, well, are, they are yeah. spreading misinformation on a daily basis. Every pot of cream is full of lies. Two wrongs don't make a right. So making so body shaming in, in the beauty industry it is absolutely wrong, um, but you know, is sort of beside the point. And, but it's is it's it, beside but the point. It is because, beside the point because do, do you uh, do you assume, as I assume, mm -hmm. that the beauty industry is also using data that's out there on me, on everybody else, to make sure they can target the kind of products that they send to our to not not necessarily our inbox to, but to our web pages when we when we Google things. I mean, is it more sinister than that? It, well, it is because you know, on on what making targeting people based on. Uh, mental vulnerab vulnerabilities, fi finding out, you know, what makes a person tick, and then trying to exploit a, a particular vulnerability in that person, to then lead them down a path of misinformation where they start clicking on things that aren't necessarily true, changing their perception, and making them believe in in some sort of conspiracy or some kind of theory that isn't actually based in any kind of reality, and then using that to undermine their confidence in civic institutions institutions, you know, is fundamentally unethical. You are deceiving someone into believing something that is not true, knowing knowing that you are coercing them into supporting you for 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 a false reason. In terms of the, the beauty, you know, if, if a beauty company is 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 targeting someone because they know that they're, they, they may be prone to anorexia or bulimia, I mean, that's absolutely Appalling. that's her, that's horrific. Mm. And, and and but but what but just because another industry does it doesn't mean that that justifies doing it in our democracy too. Chris Wiley, Both thank you. Both should be banned. Okay, Chris Wiley, stay with us. Kyle Taylor as well, founder of the Fair Vote Project. Uh, we'll take calls from you in a moment now. Dan in Leicester and Joseph in Guildford coming up after this break. It's 1.45. Right, I've been very remiss. I've been hogging the guests. Very bad trait in a person. Chris Wiley, Cambridge Analytica whistleblowers in the studio with us and Kyle Taylor, founder of the Fair Vote Project. These are two men who believe that your vote either has or could very very easily be again uh, misused, twisted, uh, cheated in a sense. Uh, are you buying it? 0345 6060 the number to call. Dan in Leicester, Joseph in Guildford, uh, good afternoon to you. Dan, fire away. Who's your question for or your point for? Um, uh, Mr. Wiley, in fact, who I'm very excited to be talking to. Hi there. Um, hello. Um, this is all very complex, obviously. I listened to your almost four hour session yesterday um, on YouTube and uh, I think the, heart, the most difficult point for, for, for a lay person like myself is to discern from all of this what it actually means in practical terms in, in simple lay person speak and I think I have a theory which I'd like to put to you and see if you could either confirm or or deny or, sure. or clarify. What I think it means is that in the case of something like Brexit some somebody, um, an independent agent, somebody like Robert Mercer, for example, mm -hmm. could use the tools at their disposal to target a small percentage of persuadable voters in order to swing a vote in a direction they want to swing it in. Yep, that's that's exactly it. Um, the, 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 the only qualifier that I would add to that is, um, so for example, when we're looking at the uh, the actual practices of Cambridge Analytica, for example, not only are they targeting that specific segment of people, but they're targeting a specific segment of people who are more prone to, uh, you know, uh, ha have a, a neurotic disposition or feel anxiety or um, believe in conspiratorial thinking, uh, and exploiting that for their own their own their own uh, you know objective, which is to facilitate an alt-right movement. Um, so it's not just targeting the right amount of people, it's also targeting the, the right amount of people with a message that isn't necessarily true or valid. And in the context of the referendum, what we're talking about is this uh, alleged overspend was used to buy ads like these. 
And so, that, I mean, that amount of money, 625,000 pounds, could have bought hundreds of millions, maybe a billion ads, uh, impressions, which means the number of times that they appear in people's news feeds. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of extra advertising on social media. And for people who don't know um, the name that Dan mentioned, Robert Mercer, he funded he's Cambridge the, Analytica. He's the alt-right uh, billionaire in New York uh, who funds Cambridge Analytica and also has funded a lot of the uh, the work that aggregate IQ has done also. Let me th thank you, Dan. Oh, go, go on, Dan. I was just saying, um, the IP for IQ's technology, essentially, is that, is that still right? Yeah, so the so aggregate IQ has um, what's called an intellectual property license uh, that uh, with uh, Cambridge Analytica, which means that um, for all the work that it's done for Cambridge Analytica, uh, Cambridge Analytica actually owns it. So even though it has a different, the company has a different name, uh, the the products and the work that the company has done are still owned by Cambridge Analytica. So the 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 the, the advantage of that, if you're trying to um, you know, if, if you're trying to obscure uh, your involvement is that you can you can have uh, different names on different invoices and it looks like they're different companies even if it's the same team or people working on it. Dan, Dan, thank you for your call. I'm going to leave it there if I may, Dan, so other people can get a look in as well. Thank you, Dan. In Leicester, Joseph in Guildford, you've got a direct question to Chris. Uh, yes, I do, Sharon. Um, hi, Chris. Hi there. If, if I'm to believe that you find Cambridge Analytica's business model morally reprehensible, why did you make a personal offer to Dominic Cummings to harvest data after you left Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica? So, so there's a bit of a, a misnomer about the conversations that I had with Don Cummings. Um, if you, the, the, of the Leave EU uh, campaign. Uh, no, of the Vote Leave campaign. The Vote Leave. Yeah. So, so I offered to. I had a. I got introduced to him, and we had several conversations about, you know, what it is that Vote Leave could do because he was quite interested in um, data and targeting and all of that, which <clears throat> ended up being a, a core part of of the Vote Leave campaign. Um, the actual proposal that I sent, if you actually read it, there's nothing um, illegal or, in, in my view, immoral about it. It's, um, you know, th th there's nothing about harvesting data without people's consent in it. it there's nothing about manipulating people or de deception. Um, I don't have a, fundamentally, I don't have a problem with, um, you know, using data to, to uh, you know, refine your messages or to show people the most relevant content of your campaign. What I take issue with is the deceptive practices that Cambridge Analytica has and also, um, you know, more fundamentally how they acquired their data without consent. Um, but actually, if you, if you look at the, the proposal that I sent to, 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 to Dom, there, there's nothing illegal or immoral about it. It's simply saying, this is what you could do. And actually, m more to the point, it was a, for a small pilot project because one of the things that I told them is I said, you know, given how little data you have, I don't even know if you can get Date, sufficient amounts of data to do this um, in the time of the referendum, um, you know, at least, you know, in, in a way that <laughs> that requires consent and, 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 and follows the law. So I don't know exactly how AIQ got all of their data in such a short amount of time, but actually if you read the proposal that I sent to him, it, it you know, is fully, it would be fully compliant with the Data Protection Act, and, and I, I don't think that there's anything, you know, immoral or unethical about it. I, I'm a data scientist. I, I, I work with data every day. Um, and just, just in the same way that, you know, a knife can be a tool or a murder weapon, data can be used in a positive way or a negative way. Joseph? Um, he described you, and I, I will quote him, he described you as a charlatan after reading your proposal. And I've read a large amount of it, and a lot of it seems very similar to what Cambridge Analytica, minus the permission um, issue on Facebook, but it, it seems very similar. You say it's not, but reading your proposal, it, it seems to be. Well, I suppose that's your interpretation of it. Um, you know, I, there's nowhere there's nowhere in that proposal that talks about deception. There's nowhere in that proposal that talks about you know coercive messaging, exploiting um, you know mental vulnerabilities. There's no there's nothing in there about misappropriation or stealing data. Um, so I think that fundamentally that proposal is. Is, is is completely different than what Cambridge Analytica does. C can I just ask you on, on something you said there in response to Joseph's initial question? Putting misappropriation to one side, because that's sure. a slightly separate issue uh, than you solve, you know, um, it's important, it's not a small matter, but what is the difference between 
because uh, I think it, I, I don't think we can um, go into this often enough. Actually, mm -hmm. what is the difference between using data as part of a campaign and doing what you described as manipulating data as part of a campaign? Because they're all about convincing people to do your will, aren't they? And give them give you their vote. Sure. So. You know, m most communication is, is if you if you take a step back, most human communication, even you know, day to day, if you go and talk to you know a person in a shop about can can you tell me where something is, you're trying to make them tell you where something is, right? So so all communication is you know has an objective, an exchange to, of data, an exchange of information, and also an attempt to change your behavior in some way, right? If if you go into a grocery store and you want something from someone, you hope that they show you it. Um, but in, but fundamentally, the difference between you know typical targeting of, of of advertising and manipulation is is the is the imbalance first of all the imbalance of information and then the objectives and the means that you're using to change that behavior. So it's one thing to say, I think that you know uh, you would really like this bottle of water because it's crisp and clean and you look thirsty, right? And me presenting that product to you. In that, in that communication, you know that, first of all, I am the water company, so you know that I'm trying to sell you something. You know what the product is. The product is real, right? And, and also, there's, there's not a significant risk of, 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 of harm in me trying to just present you this, this product. You can say no, right? But I also and, and, know whether I'm thirsty or not, and voters know what they think, don't they? So, so then when you take a step back and you look at what what is manipulation right what is coercive what is manipulation um, if i know that you are if you are that you are prone to um, anxiety for example or you're prone to you know an, you have a neurotic disposition uh, you're pr prone to conspiratorial thinking for example um, me targeting you with information that is that is deliberately designed to provoke that reaction in you, to bring out the worst trait in you, right? To work on that weakness. To, to, to yes. To aren't massage, we back to skin, to, 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 to skin to, cream to again? To massage that weakness and, and, then, but, and, then, and, then, and then present information which isn't necessarily true, but is simply designed to make you, to make you perceive something, right? Or think something. Reinforce your thought. To, to reinforce uh, your disposition and to make you behave in a particular way, irrespective of whether or not that information is true. And also secondly, without your knowledge that this information is coming, w without your knowledge of the, the true source of this information, right? So, so Which isn't you in so, the street with a bottle so, of water. Yeah, so, so, so if you see something on the internet, right, and it, it's a blog or it it's, looks like a news site, and then you start seeing this story everywhere, right, and you're also the type of person that's prone to to go down that garden path of, of, of conspiratorial thinking, right? If I'm if I'm if I'm targeting you specifically to 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 you know to provoke that that disposition in you with information that isn't necessarily true, I am that is manipulation, right? That is manipulative, right? I because you don't know what the source of that information is, and because that information isn't necessarily true, and that information is designed to make you anxious, or designed to make you conspiratorial, or designed to make you neurotic, right? But, but that again, is but again, don't. All, I mean, I've I've covered so many political campaigns in my sure. life, and they all manipulate. They all. I've I've stood and watched politicians say. There's a uh, difference. Say, there's well, a really on. big. I, no, I, no, I know they're there, but I've stood and watched politicians say. Let's think of a, Kinnick, a, a speech by Neil Kinnock mm -hmm. in the 80s. Don't be old. Don't be young. Don't be sick. Don't be frail under a Tory government. He was trying to terrify people. So there's a really big difference, right? Because when a politician says something that isn't necessarily true, they're saying it in a public forum that is open to scrutiny and debate. And you can see them. You can see them say it. The media plays a role in scrutinizing them, and the opposition plays a role in scrutinizing them. So that 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 if, if a politician lies or says something untrue, they're not saying it in a vacuum. They're not whispering it into your ear. There's a big difference between talking in the public forum and whispering something in, in someone's one ear. One is an acceptable form of manipulation, one is not. Is that your view? Well what I'm I'm not I'm not saying that there's any acceptable form of manipulation, but what I'm what I'm saying is the reason the reason why targeting Targeting plays a role in 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 making it worse, as it were, is that 
there is it is not open to any sort of public scrutiny. People don't know it's happening because okay. they don't see it, which means that the media can't play a role in scrutinizing it, and it also means that the opposition party can't play a role in scrutinizing uh, and it. And there's a difference, I think, between selling shoes and de and determining, trying to predict the outcome or determine the outcome of an election, which has irreversible effects in some cases. Okay, we'll get more calls to both of you in just a moment. Chris Wiley, the Cambridge Analytical whistleblower in the studio with us, along with Kyle Taylor, founder of the Fair Vote Project, about which we will hear more in just a few minutes. It's two minutes past two. Do you believe that your information, your online information, your emails, your use of Google, your social media is being used uh, with the dark arts against you to convince you to vote in particular ways, whether it's Brexit or any other election? 0345 973 the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Two men who think that it is, or certainly might be, are Chris Wiley, the Cambridge Analytical whistleblower who's here in the studio with me, along with Kyle Taylor, founder of the Fair Vote Project. Lots of people texting and tweeting as well as calling. We'll hear from Robert in Rochester in just a second. Uh, but Phil in Thurrock says, Nobody bought my vote. I had decided to vote leave long before the campaign. David Cameron and George Osborne lost the Remain vote, not Facebook. And this tweet from Chris says, It's very difficult for people to know or accept that their votes may have been swayed because as far as they knew, they were voting on the basis of real information. If that information was faked to play on fears, they may not realise now that they voted on lies. Um, and a lot of people listening will... It, particularly if they voted leave, we'll, we'll be thinking of that leaflet that was put through everybody's door, I think before the official campaign began uh, by the government, uh, which was described as Project Fear. Robert in Rochester, what's the question you wanted and to who, to Chris or to Kyle? Uh, to both. Okay, um, far away. I had two questions, but um, the first question uh, didn't interest your other, the uh, advisor. Um, the second question... Um, so we have political parties in this country. What information do they have on us and how are they using it? And are they using uh, information like Cambridge Analytica to gain their vote? So should I? Yeah, so I mean, I think in the, in the context of the referendum, and there was something in a, a previous tweet as well that I thought was quite interesting, is no one's talking about necessarily uh, whether, you know, your individual vote would have been leave no matter what. It's whether we're okay with just cheating more broadly. Uh, I mean, whoever does it, regardless of who does it. Mm -hmm. But just specifically on that point, so in, in this case, we're talking about um, the fact that uh, this, the vote leave campaign used aggregate IQ as their data source. Right, so they were the ones who, who were driving stuff based on the data they had. More broadly, I mean, political parties, uh, of course, they have the electoral roll, electoral register, which is the history of, of whether you voted, not how you voted, but whether you voted in an election. And they also infer and they things have, from your postcode, yeah, your shopping. Mean, yeah, there, there's public va data available. I mean, I, I've, in, the, in, the tube, in the London Tube now, there are ads for, um, you know, know your data self and use your data through, through, through large data companies. So, you know, if you have a Tesco club card and you did you ticked a box, then maybe that data is available to a political party. They're, they can they can purchase that information, um, as well as anything they get on the doorstep. So if you talk to a political party on the doorstep, if you give your email to them, they have that. But that's why you want this wholesale national review of how Absolutely. data is used. Absolutely, yeah, because it, it's more important when it when it relates to our democracy. I think. I mean, it's important in every context, but specifically what it's doing to uh, to uh, alter elections. Does it worry you, Robert? Um, yes, um, I, I have no no problem giving my data away. However, I would like to know where it's going once it's left that company or that company sold it to another company. And I think that is the important part about what we're learning about this and uh, that it be law that any company that holds your data notifies you in some way or another. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I, I, I've spoken about uh, before, because I, I hear this from a lot of people, and that, you know, obviously sometimes you need to give your data, you know, for example, to your bank so that you can have a bank account. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's valid reasons why you would give, give up your data to a company. You know, one of the things that I hear a lot from people is, but I don't know where that goes, uh, particularly in the context of elections. And when you look at the law, um, you know, in the UK with respect to donations and spending, for example, political parties have to declare uh, who gives them money and, and who are they spending that money on. 
but one of the things that may help people is a, a declaration, uh, you know, similar to uh, financial declarations in elections about how are they targeting and who are they targeting and what kind of data do they hold on people. Um, so, it, which which would help, you know, transparency uh, in terms of people finding out, you know, how was I targeted or or what what happened, uh, and then also, you know, when you look at advertising in general being clearer with people about why is it that you're seeing this ad. Because currently you don't actually have to declare to people what information are you using in order to target them. So when they see an ad, they don't necessarily know why they're seeing the ad, they just see the ad. And I think, you know, something that would help people understand better what data is out there about them and who's using what is simply requiring a declaration on advertising about why it is that you're receiving this ad and, and what is it about you that has led the targeting to target this ad to you. Um, and we at the Fair Vote Project have been trying to help people understand this with uh, explaining to people if, if, if we had uh, ads on, on social media why it's targeting you. So our, our, the stuff we've been putting up to try and get people aware that the evidence is available to them says this ad is targeting you because. So when you buy something or use a service and there's a little tick box that says uh, tick this if you are not happy for us to um, sh share your information with a third party, I always tick it. it. Is it worth anything, my tick, in those instances? Well, I, you know, the, the law currently and uh, you know with the Data Protection Act that's going to be strengthened I, I think even in a couple of weeks with the GDPR. <laughs> Um, re requires your consent for for data to be passed on, um, but that that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. um, and it also means that, you know, the the thing the thing also that um, that I think people find surprising is just that, you know, people don't read those long terms and conditions, right? But and 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 that sometimes it's not reasonable. It's not a reasonable expectation that. You know, the fact that you signed up for a coupon means that your entire life history is now on the on a market for sale for anyone who buys it. So, looking at really, is or it, if you just have a Gmail account, yeah, or you know, it or if you use Google, it, and you know, something else that I've been talking about is the fact that you know, social media, Google, the internet, email, these are unavoidable facts of life now. You can't. It's very difficult, um, you know, in the modern economy to live a life without. The internet, live it's, a life without. It's a without, new utility, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like and, and, and this is what this is one of the is things that I said at, at Parliament um, is that you know it's like saying if you don't want to get electric electrocuted, don't use electricity. You know, if you don't want to get in a car accident, don't use a car. Rather than saying if you don't want to get in a car accident, demand better safety standards for that car. And data is power now. Yeah. Let me bring Adam in just as our final caller to you both. I'll take more calls on this uh, after you've both left us because so many coming in. Adam and Carrick Fergus, just to put, put, put your question to the guys and I think I'll let uh, Carl respond, I think, because I'd like to hear more from you, Carl. Okay. Go on, Adam. Yeah, um, hi, Sheila. Hi. Nice to speak to you again. Me too. Um, yeah, it just seems to be uh, one-way traffic. It's always this, the Brexit. By the sounds of your programme, it sounds like the Brexit um, campaign cheated. How about the Remain? Do these do these guys were those guys targeted in any same uh, way or form? Um, you know, it just seems to be that you're you're calling Brexit as cheaters, and the Remain uh, side of the fence was totally. You know, you're not even talking about that. Um, you know, Brief one from both of you. Hang on, Adam. Let them respond. I'll, I'll just very quickly. Hi. Chris. So, so this is Chris talking. Um, okay. I just, I just want to say. So, I, I'm talking about um, vote leave as somebody who supported vote leave. So, d just to be I super, that, just, just well, Dom Cummings has even said I, you know, pitched to vote leave. I supported vote leave uh, on when I had, you know, a Facebook account. I, I read, you know, reposted things from from leave. I supported leave because I'm a Eurosceptic. Um, but what I don't, and so for me, this is not actually about rehashing the debate, leave or remain. For me, this is something more fundamental. I supported leave because I believe in British law and British sovereignty. But the rule of law and following British law means that we follow British law even if it's on our own side. Yeah, and I think it's important to say that I don't think anyone's saying Brexit, Brexiters cheated. I think the, the question is whether there's su uh, suspicion to suspect that vote leave and be leave cheated. And I think that's very different because that adds a bit more to the, the piece about manipulation, specifically around, you know, what do we have about the Remain campaign? Um, we, we have not had anything yet submitted to us, but we have a tool on our site. So if people out there do have information about cheating, use our, our tool and send us information because we think cheating is wrong full stop. It doesn't matter 
who did it. And if everyone did it, it's just worse. Yeah. If, if, if Remain also cheated, that just means that there was cheating everywhere in the referendum. And in my view, that makes it even worse. That calls, you know, the, 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 the yeah, integrity I mean, of the process, you know, in, into question even more. Okay, Adam, go on. We're, we're all, all, all the time we're hearing it's the negative for Brexit. Whereas, you know, I, I, for every argument um, I've had with Remainers, I've got, wherever they keep with me a point, I can, I can match it. I can answer them with a counter um, argument. Right. Um, but the thing is, you know, we, we're giving airtime this whole time here talking about Brexit and that the Brexit campaign have cheated or vote leave or uh, whatever organisation cheated. Now, you know, the, have you guys looked into the Remain? You know, are we going to talk about that tomorrow? Are we going to talk about the Remain? You know, it just seems to be that it's very... It's very convenient to talk about the Brexit cheating, but yeah, well, I mean, you know, you know what? I go ahead, Chris. I completely agree with you, right? So Me I, too. I, 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 I agree with you. So if if Remain cheated, I think that's wrong. Um, and if anybody has information on on cheating on the Remain side, you know, well, about, share it. Chris, go, you can go to fairvote.uk and deposit it. All right, go, go on, Adam. What about Chris in a week's time? You look into it yourself because you seem to have done a lot about the uh, vote leave. Well, the reason, the, into the remains. What sure, do that? The, the, I, you know, if people, the reason why I know about vote leave is because I introduced uh, several of the people who who set up the spending scheme, and I also set up the company that received the money. So the reason why I'm talking about vote leave is because I. You know I, I, I know about it. That's why I'm talking about it. It's not, and the reason why I know about it is because I supported Vote Leave, right? So, this is if if people have information on cheating on the Remain side, I, like strongly encourage it because for me this is not actually about. I, I'm a Eurosceptic. I supported I supported Leave. This is not. This really is not a, 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 about debating no. Leave or Remain. It's about whether or not we're going to tolerate cheating on the most important vote in a generation. Adam, I hope that satisfies you to bring your blood pressure down. Let me read this. Uh, your whole premise is redundant. The whole point of Cambridge Analytica is that people don't know they're being influenced. Um, obviously, no one is going to call uh, your programme, Sheila, to admit on national radio they may have been duped by Cambridge Analytica. And uh, Nick says, if money spent on the referendum needed to be equal, to be fair, why was Cameron's pro-Remain propaganda leaflet not included in the Remain campaign costs? If there's been any cheating, that was it, says Nick in Nottinghamshire. Adam, thank you for your call. If you want to go to that rally tonight, it's at 7 o'clock in Parliament Square um, where you can meet uh, all the people, uh, well, the two people who are in the studio today, Chris Wiley and Kyle Taylor. And uh, Shamir Sani will be there with them as well. Uh, the Vote Leave um, or Be Leave whistleblower, depending on how you view the story. He'll be with Majid Nawaz at 2.30 here on LBC on Saturday. He'll be down at Parliament Square as well if you want to go and see what they're up to. Uh, you're listening to Sheila Fogarty on LBC. Thanks to Chris and Kyle again for staying with us so long and taking your calls. It's 2.00. Right, well, Chris Wiley, the Cambridge Analytical whistleblower, and Kyle Taylor, founder of the Fair Vote Project, have left us now, but you're still calling 0345 6060 973. Sam in Enfield, what do you make of it? Hi, Sheila, how are you? I'm all right. Are you buying it? Um, well, I, I work in this area, so... Um, in what I, way? I in an air, well, I work in the, in the area of digital transformation and digital uh, disruption, and uh, data is really, really very, very powerful today. Com company Sheila don't spend millions and millions of pounds looking at data and the analysis behind it unless it can make a difference to what they want to achieve. And I guess what really is key here is use of data is fine. It's the abuse of the data that's the problem. And unfortunately, it's a very fine line between using data legitimately. Well, also, even before we talk about the misuse of it, how it's acquired is, would be my first question, and how much of it is acquired and for what reason, and then we can talk about how it's used. It's a good point. It, you know, I always say to all of my clients, everybody I know, if you are receiving some product or service for free, then you are the product. So, you know, things like Facebook and Gmail, you know, you receive these services supposedly for free, but in reality, they're actually capturing your data and then they're monetizing and selling that data onto other people. Now, what a lot of my clients do is, is they'll use that data to give you a personalized experience and hopefully give you something that you want to buy or that you want to receive a service about. But it could be used to also 
manipulate you, right? If if they know you're susceptible uh, to a particular story that might make you move in a particular direction. Well, it could, at, at its worst, if that's not bad enough, it could be used to blackmail people. Absolutely. In public so, positions, you know, couldn't it, very easily? It, Exactly. And, you know, uh, I, uh, it's interesting, you know, for example, you know, if you were to log in on Amazon, for example, and I logged into Amazon, you and I would both be presented with completely different screens. Based on what we've done the, before. Based on what we've done before, based on what they think we would like to see. Uh, and, you know, just a, a very simple example of this is, you know, you often will be looking at a product and they will say, people who bought this product also bought this product. And it's designed to make you, you know, go down that route of saying, oh, that's a related product, I might buy that. And just that is a very simple uh, example of analytics being used. But I don't think that's particularly sinister, do you? I find, that, I find that quite helpful. Right, so here's the thing. That is helpful, and it's use of data to actually make your customer experience better. Now, what if on the flip side, I gathered a lot of data and said to you, hey, if we stick uh, a slogan on a bus saying we're going to give 350 million quid to the NHS, that will sway X number of voters to vote leave. Uh, and they, they then go and look at the analytical data that then tells them what they should do to achieve an end result. Or, you know, you look at some analytical data and it tells you, hey, if we put a poster up of Syrian refugees and say, you know, uh, say use that, uh, like Nigel Farage did, to, to scare people into thinking, wow, if we don't vote to leave, we're going to have an influx of, of, of immigrants. And I'm sure that the Remain side, you know, did the same thing. Although uh, uh, it, th that, was a, th that was a concern that was being expressed before Nigel Farage and his poster, wasn't it? Of course, but the, the reality is... You think he was they, playing they on will, it? They will, have hit the, they will have hit the target... They will have been told by companies like Cambridge Analytica that this is a really soft target. If you do this, you'll get result. You know, you'll get the following result. And then, even but Sam, don't you problem, think? Don't you think they just have to listen to LBC or other radio programs and phone-ins in particular to hear that that was an issue? They didn't need Cambridge Analytica to know that, did they? It, it, it's very subtle, though, Sheila. You know, it, it's it's. Uh, you log into Facebook and you see all these adverts scrolling along, and you don't realise they've been tailor-made to for you. So the answer. Individual basis. The answer is what? First things first, we have to have a, a government-led inquiry, do we? There's a few answers. So the, the first one is there's GDPR regulation coming out in May of 2018 that says it's actually uh, illegal to share your information without your permission. Data so that, protection that's regulations, yeah. Data, yeah, it's a general data protection right, which hands back quite a lot of control to the individual. Uh, so that's a good thing. It has that's to be good, yeah. May. It's a really good thing. I think that I've heard a lot of people say, well, there was manipulation going on by the Russians or there was manipulation going on through Cambridge Analytica. But hey, don't worry, guys, it didn't make a difference. And I'm not buying that because people don't spend millions of pounds unless it makes a difference. And I think we really do need to look really deeply when the results are very close as it was in the, in the US election. But just because it made a difference doesn't inherently yeah. make it bad, does it? You, you have, they, they, Chris, Kyle, all of the others who say that cheating happened, they have to prove this now. I mean, that's what part of their whistleblowing is about, or his whistleblowing is about. But they do have to prove that laws were broken to access that data. They do have to prove that money was misused or overused by the Vote Leave campaign, and they haven't yet on either of those counts. Well, I think the jury's out on that, right? There, there well, yeah. is, there's talk of collusion between the two parties, there's talk of six hundred thousand pounds being spent. I'm sure the other. There, but, but there are still huge questions around uh, what information Facebook gave away and what inf or sold, uh, and what information was wrongly taken from Facebook, w with them either turning a blind eye or not knowing. Right, but here's the thing: now, now it's out into, into the open. Uh, people are just much more aware that their information is available for sale that it can be used for giving them services and products that they really want, but it could be used for manipulation. Tra transparency is really the key here. As long as everyone knows what's going on, and you know you know that maybe you're being targeted, targeted because of some data that they've used, 
as long as you have the right to withhold that data. So you shouldn't have to tick that box, Sheila. It should be a default position that says, hey, I don't want my data to be used. I'm dealing with you and only you. And exactly, I'm only dealing with you. And it's only if I give you permission to use my data, then you can. Uh, and I think that would be really important. And there's another area which is uh, is a tip of an iceberg, which no one has really talked about, which is uh, these automated artificial intelligence chatbots, which were set up in the US purporting to be real Twitter users, mm. when they're actually pieces of software. And they're literally designed to all tweet out a, a particular story. Yeah, you can see it on Twitter uh, when it happens. Exactly. Well, the thing is, I think I think people, you know, people will say, no, I voted because I wanted to vote that particular way. And, and also nobody likes to be fooled. So you might have difficulty getting people to accept that they've been fooled, if indeed they have. But nobody likes to be fooled. Sam, thank you for your call. Sam in Enfield. Uh, Harry says, Sheila. The Brexit vote was not swung by social media, as we're constantly being told ever since the day the power of decision lay in the hands of the over 50s, who famously do not use it. A desperate clutching at straws by the Romaniac refuseniks, who like zombies refuse to bow to reality, says Harry. Coming up after the news and the outbreak, we'll hear from Bertie Ahern, the former Irish Taoiseach, and uh, more of your calls as well on just how much of your information you're concerned about handing over. What do you really know about about the information that's out there on you. And if it is as extensive as it seems to be, and it isn't just Chris Wiley saying so, lots of people have been checking their Facebook book accounts since, and others, it isn't just Facebook that we're giving our information to, and being horrified at the amount of information out there. What do you want to see happen to control it, to protect it? 0345 6060 973, the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Uh, Joe has texted to say thank you for having these two articulate and intelligent men on your show. They're doing a public service, she says. Many others of you say quite the opposite and believe they're just trying to undo the referendum vote. Well, the referendum vote still stands that we are leaving the European Union a year from today. Uh, here to talk with me about this is Bertie Ahern, former Irish Taoiseach. Uh, if you want to uh, comment on what he says or on what you heard from Chris and Kyle earlier on, please do call about your data, your information data about you and how uh, you think it should or might be being used. 0345 6060973. What do you want the government to do about it? 84850 the number to text you can tweet at LBC and is it changing your relationship with social media I wonder lots of uh, people leaving Facebook for sure they're down something like 95 billion um, on the stock market so uh, in in terms of their value so clearly something's happening um, have you changed your social media life since this all broke oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three the number to call uh, well the Republic of Ireland is the fifth biggest customer for UK exports and the UK is the second biggest customer for Irish exports so whatever else you thought you knew about the relationship between the UK and the Republic of Ireland uh, that particular stat speaks volumes as we're a year away from Brexit Bertie Ahern good afternoon to you thanks for, t for, th for joining us Thank you very much, Sheila. Good afternoon to you. Tell me this uh, before we get on to more specific questions. Um, a year before Britain leaves the European Union, did you ever think it would it would come to this point? No, I didn't. You know, it, I dealt with um, politicians of both Conservative and the Labour parties at European Council meetings. I was almost 20 years going to council meetings. I was on the Social Affairs Council while I was Employment Labour Minister and then I was on the ECOFIN Council. I was three times Minister of Finance and I was three times the Teacher of Prime Minister of Ireland. So, you know, over that 20 years I was dealing with, um, you know, UK politicians and very friendly relationships that built up, you know, really good contacts. And it was one of the great things, I think, about both of us being in Europe that it opened up um, a new relationship that that had changed that bad relationship we had between our two countries over the years and Europe helped so much because you personally were dealing with these people uh, every day and um, the men and women that I dealt with I must say of all parties I got on very well with them you know it was a very healthy and very good relationship which will now all die 
once um, UK leave because we'll no longer be meeting in them in that, in that platform. And on to the border of Northern Ireland and the kind of uh, unpicked scab it's become in, the, in this, uh, the horrible imagery, but you know what I mean, um, in, the, I in, this, in this whole journey towards Brexit. You have said that you think there is an alternative to either a hard border or the EU's backstop solution of Northern Ireland effectively staying in the European Union, certainly in the customs union and the single market. What is the alternative or alternatives? Well, I suppose let's just look at where uh, we're at um, very briefly. Uh, last week, EU leaders uh, agreed in principle on a two-year transition arrangement for the UK out to the end of 2020. That effectively keeps the UK inside the EU single market for that period. Uh, the transition arrangement should provide certainty for business and everybody else. So, But unfortunately, we don't have that long time before we have to make a decision. A uh, decision on the border has to be made at the latest by Halloween, by the end of October. And probably the Irish government have said they want it by the end of June. Now, um, the backstop arrangement is fine by me, um, which that was the agreement the Irish government... But it's not fine by many Northern Irish people, is it? No, and, and it's, it's, you know, but I think the question, Sheila, and I, I just want to pose this question again. I don't have the answer, but, but then I'll come to what I think might be possible. But it, there was an agreement on the 15th of, of December, uh, which said it was a backstop arrangement, and then it was to be put into legal language. And, and that legal language was done a, a few weeks back. And then Prime Minister May came out and said that she couldn't, and no British Prime Minister could ever agree to that. Now, I have to ask the question again, why was it agreed on the 15th of December? But I'm just asking the question. The answer isn't very clear to me, other than kicking the ball down the road, which is what happened last well, week. Well, it's, it's been agreed that, it's to, that it is still the backstop, but it has not been agreed to be honoured, because clearly the government, whether it has one or not, is saying it will come up with an alternative. Yeah, well, that's it. But but they're, they're also saying, they're not just saying that, Sheila, they're saying um, that if they come up with an alternative, great. But if if they can't come up with an alternative, they're not going to honour the backstop. Mm. The Prime Minister has been very clear. And so is Arlene Foster. But, I mean, there, there, there lies a very big problem. Now, I, I think the solution is, and I can't think of another solution, um, but my, my solution is that uh, the United Kingdom have to uh, get an arrangement with the EU that's very close to what the present customs union is. It doesn't have to be called a customs union. It can be, it be called ABC as far as I'm concerned. And to those who say that will just make us look like fools, what do you say? Well, I don't think it will. Um, I, 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 you know, I have no argument about the decision. I wish it didn't happen, but you know, I don't. I'm not one of these people who believe that the, uh, the there should be another vote in the UK. I, I, I don't go down that road. I don't go down the road of saying they're wrong or right. I, I feel sorry that it ever happened, but I'm not. I'm not into that argument. But I, I do see several huge advantages for the United Kingdom of staying in the, close to the customs union. Uh, and I don't think that affects their trading relationship. And I'll give you just one example for that. Um, if the United Kingdom correctly want to go out, and I'm glad that they're going to be allowed to do it in the transitional period to build up new contracts. But if you go out to a country uh, to build up a new trading contract, and that country already has a trading contract with the far bigger European Union of 450 million people, they're not going to give better terms to the United Kingdom. No, no company would do that. It's nothing against the United Kingdom. No, co no business would do that. You won't give a better arrangement to somebody that has attend to your business uh, as against a company that is 100% your business. Just no, nobody in their right mind to do that. So I think the advantage for the UK is staying very close to the Customs Union is that they can go get their new contracts but still uh, hold on to the, to the same kind of a contracts that are there in the, in the, in the Customs Union at, at this time. And I, I don't see a down stop to that because well, there's well, not somebody... a whole lot of countries out there looking to give better terms to the UK. I mean, that's, well, that's just not true. Uh, but, but you know as well as I do that at very senior levels in the Conservative, in the government, in the Conservative Party, voices like Liam Fox and Theresa May uh, repeating time and again that those red lines of hers will all be honoured. 
it, they say two things, don't they? They say that uh, the Irish government, um, uh, the leader Leo Varadkar, um, uh, can't have the firm guarantees sooner than the end of the negotiations when the deal is struck, because until we know the end state of the EU-UK uh, trade relationship, we can't start talking about what the uh, relationship with the Republic will be. That then leaves, as you know, I mean, I'm telling you to suck eggs here, you know yeah, that that yeah, then still yeah. leaves the question open about the hard border. But you talked about how mutual membership of the European Union dramatically improved relations between the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Do you fear that our departure, the UK's departure from the EU, will dramatically damage that relationship? Well, it's self-evident because a lot of relationships are personal. Um, they ca you can't write them down on a sheet of paper. And I think the, the tawing of the um, relationships over the last 40 years uh, was fundamentally, in my view, and I was there for 20 of them, uh, and I've talked to the people who were there before me and after me, and it, it, it did give us a chance you know, of, like I dealt with Norm Lamont, I dealt with Ken Clark, you know, we dealt with John Major on the peace process, we, we, we dealt with the, all the Labour leaders and you know it did the relationship I had with Tony Blair but it, it wasn't me it was every Irish politician and we built up and usually fought together on the one side at the negotiating table in Europe there were not many times that we that we differed and we our officials worked together and there was meetings as, as you know in Brussels maybe some people feel there's too many meetings but you know that's the way it is and they're all the time meeting and those relationships were built up and unfortunately Unfortunately, um, very soon that ends. All that personal contact ends. And you know, people can say, people who don't know what they're talking about can say, Asher, you know, that's not an important thing. But I can tell you, somebody who lived it for 20 years, uh, I you know, treasured those relationships I had. I mean, see, it is an important thing. I mean, any, anyone who works knows that it's an important thing to have good, direct, face-to-face, yeah. -face, whites of the eye, good relations with people. Yeah, and it, it, was, it was at ministerial level, it was at leadership level, but it was at official level as well. Our civil servants got very comfortable dealing with the civil servants in various departments. We cooperated on all kinds of areas. I remember during the foot and mouth crisis a decade ago or more, uh, those close relationships. So there were really, really that was a really, really p important part uh, of the relationship between between Ireland and, and are you and, and, and in a word, if you would, are, are you more optimistic than pessimistic that a deal can be reached that suits both sides? Um, I, 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 I'd have to say I'm sitting on the fence because <laughs> I was I was very um, optimistic after the 15th uh, of, of December, but I, I don't understand how a deal was made on the 15th of December. It said ABC, but when that was turned into legal language, all of a sudden it, it, it wasn't a good idea. Now, perhaps, you know, back to, to my solution, if, if the, if the uh, British government make a trading relationship with the EU that's very like or very similar to the um, to, to the uh, present customs union, then I think I would be optimistic. If that can't happen, I'm going to be very pessimistic. Okay. Betty Ahern, thank you very much indeed. Good to talk to you. Uh, former Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland. We'll hear from the Welsh First Minister in a moment, Carwyn Jones. Um, we're a year on uh, ahead on uh, Brexit, a year away from Brexit, so we're getting uh, just a, a sense of what some of the other parts of the country and their political representatives or former political representatives feel about the way forward. That's coming up uh, in just a moment. Feel free to call on Brexit um, a year away from it. Uh, more calls on our data as well. Facebook, Cambridge Analytica. 0345 6060 973 the number to call uh, on whatever you wish to speak about. It's 2.48 now. James has called from Clapham to talk about uh, the EU and the Republic of Ireland and our relationship with them. Hello, James. Hello, Sheila. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, Fernando, Sheila. Oh, Fernando, to you as well. My Irish is terrible. Don't make me speak it. No, it's well, Sheila. Fernando. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you... You see, that's how bad it is. I thought you were speaking Irish to me. No, good afternoon. Oh, well, hello. <laughs> hello, uh, Sheila. Um, uh, basically, was it Bertie O'Hearn you had on last? It was, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, with Bertie O'Hearn, no, I respect the man and the decisions and what he did over the Good Friday Agreement. I cannot fault what he did. But I'm sick and tired of these ex-leaders saying that they don't want to interfere with this country, that the democratic vote is done, and but we should still stay in the union. The, the, uh, whatever customs the union. union is going to be, the customs union, whether it be a, a, by another name. No, we do not need it. They are panicking. 
because it's less than a year until we leave. They need us more than we need them because they're trying to say that there's a big, massive uh, community out there that we need to go and trade with. They forget that the Germans do a lot of trades with us. So do the French, so do the Spanish. They need us. So... But but they're not. But to be honest, James, to be honest, um, Michel Barnier's most recent comments tell us that he understands that. He said, and Donald Tusk has said it, uh, it is going to be painful for both sides. There is no winner. We're all going to lose out. Sheila, but they've never acted, they've never treated us with any respect. They've come out like the headmaster uh, talking to rebellious children, telling us, oh, the woes of the world is going to happen. We have made our decision, and the gentleman you going to have on next, Mr. Carwin Jones, the First Minister of Wales, needs mm. to understand as well, the people of Wales voted to leave. He is acting like Nicola Sturgeon, that the people of Wales voted to remain. Mr. Mr. Jones, if you are listening, we voted to leave, stop messing around with our future and start representing the people of Wales and stop representing yourself. Do you accept that there are some nuances to this departure that, that just have to be taken into account, James? It's not just a bish, bash, yes, bosh, out we go. Yes, Sheila, I totally agree with you. But the dissolved governments of Scotland and Ireland, uh, or Scotland and Wales, are basically playing ball with Brexit. They are telling the peers to vote against the bills. Mr. Carwin Jones needs to understand the people of Wales voted to leave. The United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave. Stop playing around with it. Work with the Is, is he? Is he, though? Because deal. all. No, hang on. All Carwin Jones asked for from Theresa May most recently, as I recall, when she gave her speech about Brexit, um, is that she has yet to explain how, outside of the Single Market and Customs Union, uh, she can get the frictionless or near frictionless trade with the EU. Yeah, but also... She hasn't, has she? What Carwin Jones is doing as well, Sheila, he is telling the Prime Minister that the powers that will come back from Brussels to uh, the United Kingdom, he wants... No, he doesn't. He's not going to get those powers. The powers that were agreed is the dissolved powers. He needs to understand the people of Wales have made a decision. He needs to carry it out and stop complaining and putting his feet in and thinking that we voted to remain. We did not. But isn't he just hoping that it can be the best deal possible for Wales? He is a dead man walking, Sheila, after what happened to Mr Sargent. He's a dead man walking. We do not respect the man. We want him to stand down and we want the Labour cabal in, in Wales to end. OK. All right, James. Well, I'll be sure to put those points to him when, he, when we speak to him in about an hour's time. Thank you, James, in Clapham. Uh, Brian has called uh, from Cambridge also to talk about Bertie Hearn or in light of Bertie Hearn's chat with us. Hi, Brian. Hi, is Bertie still online? I'm afraid he's not. No, he's gone. Uh, OK, so that was a recording. OK. Well, no, it was live, but he's gone now. Okay, well, that's a shame, um, because I had something to say to him. Um, Anyway, having said that, what annoys me about all this controversy about the border is the fact that there is never going to be a border again, and certainly not a border in the way that it was during what was called the Troubles in the 70s and the 80s, right? Right. Definitely, well, there's definitely not going to be a border. I mean, the thing about it is this, that the Irish... um, are, the, are, are not the ones that want to have a border. The British are not the ones that want to have a border. It's actually the European Union that wants to have a border. And that's the problem. Well, it, you say the European Union wants to have a border. They're two they different do. countries. One of them will be a member of the EU and one of them won't. Yes. Well, Ireland definitely doesn't want to have a border. So England, Britain doesn't want to have a border. The reason why the EU wants to have a border is because... Well, I've spoken to some DUP um, uh, MPs who would be quite relaxed about the border. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Except except it breaks the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, so it's absolutely wrong. We don't have to have a border. The reason why the EU wants to have a border is because when we leave, Britain is going to be able to uh, uh, trade with places like India and China, tariff-free. And things in the north of Ireland are going to be much cheaper. And the reason why the EU wants to have the border is because they don't want people from Ireland travelling up north to, to buy the cheap things. I mean, there isn't going to be a movement of people from the north going shopping down south. I mean, as far as... Uh, lorries are concerned. I, I don't see what the problem is. I mean, you know, when we go, when I drive to France and I go through the Channel Tunnel, the lorries are stopped, right? And they're whatever they have to do and the cars are stopped. I mean, there is a certain amount. It's never going to be like that in Ireland because most of the traffic, most of the trade within Ireland is actually done within each individual country. I mean, I, I think this is, what they're trying to say is, is if we leave, there's going to be trouble in Northern Ireland. Well, there isn't. 
It's certainly not as a result of that. Well, I hope you're right, Brian. Brian in Cambridge. Let me read a couple of uh, texts that have come in as well um, in relation to Cambridge Analytica and data protection, something that we spoke about a lot this hour. Um, uh, Psycho B. Delic says it's because we're not prepared to pay for anything. And for me, it's a fair price to pay for an amazing service. Talking about data. Uh, all smartphone video games require access to your contact list and more, says Steve. How many children care when the game is, quotes, free? Um, this unnamed text says, Sheila, the Pandora's box has been opened when it comes to our data and it cannot be closed shut. Uh, talk more about this, no doubt, um, in the coming weeks. I am through a minute, it's time, time.